Welcome back to Nickelodeon's Comic Corner, classic slash non-classic. This is episode number 852, uh, 53, and double shot number 747. Yeah, this is the first of three Comic Corners in a row I'm doing today, along with two manga reviews and four anime reviews. Overall, actually, five anime Overall, I'm going to put up about ten videos today, so i got a lot of work to do, so let's not waste any more time. I got two Marvel trades. First up, it is... Wolverine Origin 2. Yes, the sequel to Wolverine Origin by Phil... I think it was like Bill... Uh, it was Phil Jenkins and... It was Paul Jenkins and Andy Kubert who worked on the original one. Yep. Which, that particular one was loosely adapted into the first 10 minutes of x Mord Wolverine. This is, is the sequel to x Origin, uh, to Wolverine Origin... This one was done by Karen Gillian. By the way, I have a couple more trades featuring him uh, two episodes from now. Done by him, and I work by Andy Kuber. Set just a few years after the events of the previous series. Yep. Oh, in case you're wondering, does Wolverine himself actually speak a word in the series? He doesn't speak. As, he doesn't speak until about halfway through this five-issue limited series. Yep. And of course, he gets his sort of his first. Kind of, I would say, one of his earliest encounters with Victor Creed, a.k.a. Sabretooth. Though he's now referred to as Sabretooth the entire trade. We also could chance to meet somebody we've never suspected Sabretooth having. A sister, who also has a healing factor, just like him. And Wolverine, it's, it's implied Wolverine actually fell in love with her. And it looked like they were going to do it, and they got interrupted by a bunch of goons. Of course, Wolverine himself got him, it, accidentally got involved in a circus, and he was called... Mr. Sa he was called the Savage, and he was basically just wearing nothing but a loincloth. I I don't have a problem with the way Karen Gillian wrote Wolverine here. I know one particular person, I'm not gonna name names. He didn't really like the series at all, especially the whole circus stuff. Yeah, he thought because it's a follow-up to Origin, the first Origin series Wolverine, that it might be good. He didn't care for it. he dropped it for the first issue. Me, on the other hand, I actually thoroughly enjoyed reading this again. And it's actually a really good series. If you're a fan of Wolverine, I highly recommend checking this out. If you like Karen Gillian's work, I do recommend checking this out. It's probably one of his most best recent work he's done. And in case you're wondering, like, how long ago did, was this miniseries released? This was released back in... Well, it was released in 2013, 2015. Yeah, I think there might have been some delay with the book, but yeah. Pretty good. I'm going to give this book a 9 out of 10. It's really good. Yep, I kind of wish there was a third one of these, but no. Yeah, surprisingly, this only came out like like just a few years ago, and like about five years ago, and there's not a follow-up to it. No. And this one only came out roughly like almost 10 years after the first one. All right, first, next up is... Amazing Spider-Man, Peter Parker, the one and only. Yeah, this is basically Amazing Spider-Man 700.1 to 700.5. Yeah, these were basically a series of five issues released right after the cancellation of Amazing Spider-Man. Well, this is back in 2013 when it was released. And because of the success of these, we've had two more of these point ones series. Yeah, we have one the following year in 2014 with the Learning to Crawl story and in 2015 with the Amazing Grace story. All because this was a big hit for Marvel. Yeah, uh, yeah, apparently people actually liked these particular thing, these particular uh these little point one series. Though in the case second one I think it was actually good because it kind of takes place excuse me, right after uh the death of Ben Parker like almost immediately like the next day. Mhm. Mm this is just a series of stories featuring Peter Parker, though this is published at a time when Dr. Octopus was taking his body for a joyride for a whole year. Yeah, I have no idea what Slot did that for. Yep. In case you're wondering, does Slot have anything to do with the stories in here? Absolutely not. He writes nothing in here. Uh, I think there's a cover done by uh, one, one, one people who work with Slot. Okay, there is at least a half, at least uh, six stories in here. There is a story, Frost, written by David Morrell, artwork by the legendary Claus Johnson, Black Lodge, done by Joe Casey, artwork by Timothy Green II, Cat and Mouse, a black cat mystery. Yeah, this is a story where Black Cat and Spider-Man team up some kind of 
jewel heist. It was some kind of jewel thing. That was a really interesting little story. Written by Jen Van Meter and artwork by Emma Rios. Three o'clock, three o'clock high is written by Clay McLean Chapman and the artwork and the coloring is done by Javier Rodriguez. Spiring the Human Torch State of the Universe. This was a dumb story. Written by Brian Wee, art by Sean Chen. I've actually met this guy, written this person. This one's What Would Spider Man Do? Written by Kevin Gro- Grovex and artwork by Lee Weeks. Frost is simply just Spider Man caught in a blizzard and trying to get home to Aunt May when, when he's in the middle of the city. He, he saves a whole building of people from a fire. Yeah, he also saves. He also helps an ambulance for someone who nearly dies. He basically also helps back and forth. I think he's freezing to death. Another story, I think this is the, yeah, second story, the Black Lodge. A hospital. And, of course, Spider-Man himself does not wear his costume. He's badly burned, though he's slowly healing. Yeah, in case some of you don't know, Spider-Man has a healing factor, but it works kind of slower than Wolverine's. But he heals a lot quicker than normal people. So you can kind of say that, yes, He's kind of he has a well, healing fact, just like Wolverine, but it takes him a while. But the only difference is, it doesn't like heal instantly. It takes a little while longer for Peter to heal than, let's say, Logan or anybody else who has a healing factor. Yeah, and he's in a, he's in a hospital for supervillains. Yes, and apparently because the residents are sort of tearing each other apart, the uh, the the patients instead of like you know helping them or at least subduing them. The head doctor's like, nope, I'm not dealing with this. And he tells the staff, pack up your stuff. We're leaving. We're going to let this hospital burn to the ground without helping any of our patients. Yes, that's how stupidly this guy is written. The artwork in here, I've seen this artwork before. It's not terrible artwork. It's not my personal favorite artwork, but it's actually not bad per se. Here's some artwork by Claus Johns. This is beautiful. Yeah, Claus Johns is a fantastic. He's one of the, probably one, one of the, best artist in the industry. It's just too bad he doesn't get a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Each one of these stories is all Mm two-parters. Yeah, and also in the Frost story, Spiderman's got hallucinations. Mm -hmm. Here's the artwork for the story The Black Lodge. Like, wow, this artwork is a bit bizarre, but it's not bad artwork. Yeah, and this one's done by Timothy Green. Yeah, it's not bad artwork. Mm-hmm. Uh, Three o'clock high. I think this is the one featuring the Flash Thompson story, right? I think so. Let me get to it here. Yeah, I believe this artist, uh, the the writer who wrote the Black Cat story with Spider-Man, I think this is the same one who wrote the uh, Black Cat miniseries. Yeah, this one is just the Three Clock High. This is basically just, well, Spider-Man helping a kid deal with a bully. Yep, and it's just a quick little standalone story. Spider-Man Human Torch the Universe. Best thing about this story is the artwork. The, art, the story is just not very good. It's like, okay, we have giants are going nuts over... Apparently, Reridge developing a device that could destroy the universe, and it was just nothing. And, of course, the Fantastic Four ended up in Mary Jane Watson's living room in this story. Oh, yeah, in case you're wondering what the Fantastic Four alphas look like this period of time, they look like this. It seemed like this was a past story, in a way, because they actually, at the time this was being published, their costumes were white and black. As for why they're back, this must have been an earlier story that simply just was unpublished. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, the last one is just a really nice, heartwarming story of a of a of Spider-Man saving a kid, and the kid later dies. And of course, the kid it's kind of implied the kid, uh, kind of it's kind of implied the kid may know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, but he takes Steve with him to the grave, and his parents are actually not mad at him, but they were grateful to him that he was with their son when he died. Yeah. And the fact he's up by his side, and the fact he was a big fan of Spider-Man. He drew pictures, and they did not know 
anything about Peter Parker being Spider-Man. The only thing they knew about Peter Parker was that he was Spider-Man's photographer. That's simply all it was for this to come to this particular story. The stories in here are really, really good. I do highly recommend getting this trade if you're a fan of Spider-Man. And also a fan of the, the writers and artists in here. Because this book, a 9.5 out of 10, is really good. Okay? All right, that's it for this episode. Stay tuned for next episode. Talk about two more Marvel trades. One is a very controversial one because it's a Bendis one. Yep. But until you see you on my next review, bye.